Well, thank each and every one of you for your flexibility. First, from last Sunday, by interacting with Pastor Phil, preaching in my absence, and uh, I, I, uh, I trust that every word out of your mouth this whole week has been one of purity and, and just encouragement and righteousness. Right, Mark? Okay, Mark's got it. Did the rest of you live it out correctly? Do you need to hear it again? I'll, I'll have him come up. No, just kidding. Um, but thank you for that. And thanks also for your flexibility with me coming in here as well. I really, really appreciate it. Um, the challenge as a pastor is sometimes to figure out, okay, Lord, what is it that you want us to talk about? What is it that you want us to, uh, to dig into each and every Sunday? Several months ago, I, I realized, you know, I think God's put it on my heart to try to take everyone through the entire Bible. And then the question is, okay, Lord, so is it verse by verse throughout the entire thing? Because that might take a while. And uh, where I've landed is, we're going to hit kind of God's greatest hits of the Scripture in the Bible. So not every single little verse. But we're going to go through the entire Bible in about six months. Each, each service is going to be very di- different, but each one's going to kind of build on the previous one. And we're not going to just skip over some of the more controversial and difficult passages, okay? So, for instance, a couple of weeks ago, I had not intended on my own to get into a really controversial passage in our time with God and, and even in our, our preaching. But when I realized that this particular controversial passage was a part of that which I was kind of preaching on, it was just a little later in that chapter, I was like, well, we better go ahead and alert people that, you know what, there are parts of the Bible that are hard to understand and that we kind of have to dig into. And if you remember, that was the part of the Bible that said that, that uh, women should be silent in church. If you got a question, go ask your man at home. Uh, in the first service, that didn't go over well, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, in this service, it wouldn't have gone over well either. And I didn't even get to that part of the Bible, um, but it was in, in, the, in the bulletin. Now, um, and I sent out a little email to those of you that, that have email addresses on our, our church uh, uh, little server there and said, hey, by the way, I support my mom who is an ordained pastor. So you know that I have a very different kind of understanding of, of how that passage should be interpreted. Now, we will get to that whole idea in the midst of going through the Bible here in a year. And today we're going to go into Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, chapter two and, and these are really controversial passages too, but we're not going to kind of shy away from that. However, I'm not going to do a three-hour description of them and kind of interacting with them for hours and hours. I'm just going to do a little, little touch on it today. And then in the weeks to come, we're going to keep coming back to it just as the rest of the scripture does, because this is talking about the beginnings of of the world. And uh, different parts of the Bible come back to that again and again and again. The picture behind me is not a picture of one of my Bibles. However, I do have Bibles that look roughly like that, because I've just really interacted with it. And I've taken it and I've uh, written different things and circled things and just kind of back and forth and back and forth. And I like that picture because series that I am just t- entitling it interacting with the Bible because some people think that you ought to just read it once and then you're done you're like well I've read the Bible I know the story and other people think well no uh, you should take like just a few key verses kind of memorize them and then then you're good because you've got kind of some key verses but even the ancient Israelites and then then the ancient Jews you know as they would start to compile these bits of the Bible and written scripture they would do all kinds of things to interact with the Bible. So they would, they would read it sometimes word by word by word, and they would sometimes even have these styluses, and I've, I've seen this, where it's like you're holding this little pointer, and some of them even have like a little hand with a finger at the very end of, of that, and they would look at it, and it's like they're looking word, 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 and just pouring over it and, and thinking about it in their mind. And then um, the, some of them would mutter, mutter, you know, say it over and over again, you know, just trying to figure out, okay, what is this? And then they might pray on it, and then they might talk with other people about it and argue about it, and then they would read other books about it and just continue to interact with this Bible. And in that whole process, they believed that God was revealing God's will. So it's as if, as we were trying each day to figure out, okay, is this thought, is it from God? So is it like God's voice, or is it Nathan's thought? Or is it somebody else's thought that just is coming back in my head? God inspired people to write writings and then to compile them and to pass them down so that this would be a tool that would help us to sort out, is it my thought, is it an evil thought, 
Is it great granddad's thought or is it God taking all that I know and giving me that thought? This is the tool to help sort that out. Does that make sense? So it's still a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit, which we've been talking about for weeks. It's still this personal relationship, but it's as though that person then comes to us with a book and a tool that as that person, the Holy Spirit, interacts with us, if we have this and we interact with this tool, it helps us to sort out thought from thought to hear what God is saying to us. That means if you're just looking at the book apart from the Holy Spirit, you might go astray. If you're just talking to the Holy Spirit and you ignore the book, you may misinterpret what that Spirit is saying. But if you put it all together, then it helps. Okay? All right. So um, I have a a short video uh, um, that if it plays right, it'll kind of give you a good overview of of the Bible and kind of how it was put together and everything. It's put together by this group called the Bible Project. And uh, uh, if it plays great, then, then fine. If it doesn't, no big deal. I'll kind of give you the quick summary and everything else. Guys, what do you think? Is it going to play? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Who knows? The Bible. It's one of the most influential books in human history. It explores the big questions of why we exist. It's inspired many people to do amazing things. And confused many others. And you've probably got one sitting around somewhere. So, what is the Bible actually? Well, the Bible is a small library of books that all emerged out of the history of the people of ancient Israel. And in one sense, they were just like any other ancient civilization. But among them were a long line of individuals called prophets. And they viewed Israel's story as anything but ordinary. They saw it as a central part of what God was doing for all humanity. And these prophets were literary geniuses. Really? Yeah, they expertly crafted the Hebrew language to write epic narratives, very sophisticated poetry. They were masters of metaphor and storytelling, and they leveraged all of this to explore life's most complicated questions about death and life and the human struggle. So there's a lot of different authors writing this book. Yeah, and these texts were produced over a thousand year period, starting with Israel's origins in Egypt, then leading up to their kingdom with their first temple. But eventually they were conquered by the Babylonians who took them away into exile. Then at a crucial moment in their history, many Israelites returned to their land. They built a second temple, they reformed their identity, and this is when the Jewish scriptures began to be formed into the shape that we have them today. Okay, the Jewish Bible. What's in it? Well, in Hebrew, it's called by an acronym, Tanakh. The T stands for Torah, sometimes called the Law. That's Israel's five-book foundation story. The N stands for Nevi'im, the Hebrew word for prophets. And this section consists of the historical books that tell Israel's story from the prophet's point of view. Then you get the poetic books of the prophets themselves. The K stands for Ketavim, the Hebrew word for writings. This is a diverse collection of poetic books, wisdom books, and more narrative. And the Jewish people believed that through all of these literary works, God speaks to his people. Now, there were other Jewish writings being produced during this second temple period as well. Yeah, a really diverse group of texts. And these two were highly valued in Jewish communities. And there was debate from ancient times about whether or not some of these should be considered part of their scriptures. So this is a lot of different writings over a long period of time. Why did they put them all together like this? Well, altogether, these texts tell an epic story about how God is working through these people to bring order and beauty out of the chaos of our world. And it all builds up to a hope for a new leader who would come and renew all creation. And then the Tanakh concludes, and this leader never comes. So it's an expertly crafted work, but it's missing an ending? That's exactly right. Now, a few centuries later, a Jewish prophet comes onto the scene named Jesus of Nazareth. He claimed he was carrying the Tanakh story forward. Yeah, so Jesus did a bunch of cool stuff was killed, but his followers claimed he was alive from the dead. Yeah, they said that Jesus was that long-awaited leader who would restore the world. And so his earliest followers, called apostles, they composed new literary works about the story of Jesus. They called these good news or the gospel. They formed an account called Acts about the spread of the Jesus movement outside of Israel. And then they circulated letters to different Jesus communities all around the ancient world. And they saw these writings as part of the scripture. Yeah, the apostles wrote all of this as the fulfillment of that epic story found in the Tanakh. And they were continuing the literary genius of the Jewish tradition. 
They also believed that God was speaking to his people through these texts alongside the scriptures of Israel. So that's the Old and New Testament. But what did the early Christians think of the other Second Temple literature? Well, different groups had different views about some of these books, but we know they read them and valued these texts because they passed them along with the Jewish scriptures. Okay, so we've got the Tanakh, the Jewish scriptures. We've got these other Second Temple period works. Then the writing of the apostles about Jesus. And that's a lot of literature, so what's in my Bible? So the Christian movement has taken different forms over 2,000 years, and from the beginning, all Christians recognized the Tanakh and the New Testament as scripture. And for centuries, much of the Second Temple literature was read as part of the biblical tradition. The Catholic Church eventually made it official and called some of the books from this collection the Deuterocanonical books. Some Orthodox churches used even more books from this Second Temple literature. And then in the 1500s, during the Reformation, Protestant Christians wanted to go back to the oldest writings of the prophets and apostles, so they accepted only the Old and New Testaments. Okay, I think I got it. But how does a collection of books produced over a thousand years by all these different authors tell one unified story? Yeah, that's the question we'll address in our next video. Hey, I'm John. Um, now we're going to do a quiz. And uh, no, <laughs> I'm kidding. No, but you get the idea. Like, this is a complicated book. But here's something that I find absolutely exciting. And um, in this day and age, I, I want to make sure that people know uh, because when... I talk with different folks. A lot of folks are, are really kind of um, worried about the rise of Islam. Have you ever have you noticed that? And um, the main book for Islam is called the Quran. Exactly. The Quran was written by, um, in their understanding, written by Muhammad under the inspiration of a particular angel that's, that's just telling him what to write down. One person writing all this down in Arabic. And they say, this is perfect. Like, it's absolutely perfect as it is, and it has always been perfect, and it has never changed. And what's interesting is, as folks study the history of it all, and they, they give it um, some scrutiny, and they look at it, uh, if, if you notice, like, different uh, Muslims that really dig into it like that, they start realizing, ooh, wait a second. Actually, there, there were some, some questions about what was really written, and some changes, and, and different groups were arguing over which which kind of interpretation is right, and then they kind of argue amongst themselves and stuff. So you start realizing, well, that book isn't that absolute perfect thing that it's claimed to be. And, but that's, that kind of freaks folks out. If you're Muslim, like, that's a real problem because you're basing it all on this idea, one person, one revelation, one written um, work in one language, absolutely perfect, and it always is perfect and everything else. Um, but it, it doesn't hold up to scrutiny like that. So they've got to, like, always push that kind of academic scrutiny away and say, no, 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 we don't want to get into that. We don't want to get into that. On the Christian side, when academics look at the Bible and they say, wait a second, it was written by a lot of different folks and stuff was kind of changed throughout time and then they were kind of edited together and then, then the interpretations have been different and, and uh, we Christians say, yeah, <laughs> like we've always known that. Like that's always been the case. Like we've, we've always looked at the Bible, whether you were a Jewish rabbi or a Christian scholar, we've always said we've got to really work at the interpretation of it and try to figure out, you know, which, which ancient text is exactly more authentic and stuff and putting it together. There are always footnotes in our Bible saying this word and other, other manuscripts or maybe this word. It doesn't freak us out. We say, no, we've always said that that was the case. And you may say, no, that's not what I was taught. I was taught the Bible was like one revelation, boom. You don't put a coffee cup on it or anything because it's like this perfect thing. Well, in the eight, late 1800s, um, Christians started trying to make it that because they realized, oh, wait, science is, is arising. And, and so everything in the Bible must line up exactly as science and the Enlightenment would say. And they tried to make it into an Enlightenment book, but it wasn't. It was written way before that, and the truth therein has stood the test of time even up until today, so that now when we start looking at the scripture and trying to figure it out, and you, you may say, wow, I'm not sure how to interpret this, or I'm not sure exactly what's right here, because some Christians say this and some Christians say that. For some people, that's led them to say, well, then I don't want to believe any of it, because if I can't have that enlightenment scientific absolutism, then it must be false. But if you step back for a second and you say, wait a second, 
there is truth in this scripture that has lasted the test of time through wars and through all kinds of different problems and and even up until today some of our best scientific minds still look at that and they say wait no 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 we can't we can't throw this out like there is truth here that God has revealed that is powerful and that is just amazing that's really really beautiful so as we go through in the coming weeks, you'll probably kind of pick up a little more on what I'm talking about, all right? So just as an example, let's go to Genesis chapter 1. And this is the origin story. It's at the very beginning of the Bible. Can you find Genesis if you're looking in your Bible? It's pretty easy. You just start flipping through all the, the preview stuff from whatever publisher published your Bible, and then boom, there's Genesis. It's the very, very beginning. Genesis even means origins, beginnings. And the beginning of the Bible even says, in the beginning when God created, or in the beginning God created, the heavens and the earth. So I'm just going to read through some of this and we're going to interact with it. The earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let's say that together, let there be light. And there was light, and God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. He called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. And God called the dome sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was what? Let's pause there for a second. It's good. Now, how many gods are active here? One God. So in this ancient, ancient time, all right? And so we're talking about stuff that was probably passed down orally from parent to child to parent to child, parent to child, you know, throughout generations, and, and then is being written down with this understanding that this goes way, 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 way back. I mean, these are, these are foundational stories that, that people understood that God was somehow putting on people's hearts and minds that were so powerful and true that they're passed down generation to generation. But in the midst of the, the land, you know, we'll just call it Israel for now, that land of Israel where these people are living, there are other competing stories of how stuff began, and they are weird You've got multiple gods kind of fighting it out. You've got gods having sex with other gods and that creating stuff like that. You've got, uh, uh, you know, um, a head splitting open. You know, later, later some, some, uh, uh, another myth where it's like head splits open and stuff pops out of it. I mean, weird, 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 weird. And in the midst of that, God inspires this writing to say, no, there's one God and it wasn't tough for me. <laughs> I just creatively created you know, speak, it happens, speak, it happens, and there's this progression thing after thing after thing. Where's the sun? Hasn't even been mentioned yet. Maybe it was created at the very beginning where it says God created the heavens and the earth and it was all there and now we're looking at it from a different perspective where you start seeing things and maybe it's out there but there, maybe there's this water vapor and you just kind of see this glow and, and if we were on earth we wouldn't have understood that there was sun and stars and then later it, it kind of dissipates and then you see them and we don't know we don't know how all this put together but but here we go one God doing it it's not difficult and why does God create it all if I were to ask an artist why did you paint that painting and it wasn't that somebody asked them to do it they just did it then the artist has trouble saying why they did it you artists out there you get that right it's the creative process why did you write that poem I don't know. I sat down, I started having some words that came, and I just started writing it. Why did you draw that? I don't know. I just had this, I just wanted to create. And God just wants to create. Verse 11. Then God said, let earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with seed in it, and it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants. Wait, the earth brought forth vegetation. Interesting, right? We find this idea repeated again and again. God's doing something, but it's participatory sometimes with the earth or with the animals or with the humans. Plants yielding seed of every kind, trees of every kind, bearing fruit with seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. 
And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let, them be li- and let there be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights. The greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. <laughs> Isn't this cool? Like if you think about the vastness of creation and how many stars there are, and the Bible's like, and God made the stars. Pretty easy for God to do. You see, I mean, that's just like this amazing kind of juxtaposition between how magnificent stuff is and it's easy for God. <laughs> God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule upon or rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. How many gods are doing this? One God. And you know the ancient peoples, right? You have a different God for the birds or a different God for the sea, different God for the fish, all that kind of stuff. And the ancient Israelites were like, no, 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 no. God's inspiring us. There's one God that's doing it all. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas. And let the birds multiply on the earth. You see the partnership. God's creating some kinds of stuff and then says, Okay, now you all go and you multiply and continue to, to create, fill the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, and you shall have them for food. Now, wait a second. Who's God talking to? Humans. And I messed up, and I caught this in the first service, but I didn't have time to fix it. I messed up. I left out the creation of humans in chapter 1 as though we didn't matter. Sorry about that. So now I'm going to get out the Bible and I'm going to read. Now this is a little different translation, but it's the same, same general idea. So from verse 26 on forward. So we can just stay on this slide for just a second. I'm going to get us up to there. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. The hour has always kind of confused folks sometimes. Is it like this royalty idea, which could be? A king says, let us make this law, and just talking about the king. Or maybe it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's looking at it from the Christian perspective backwards, which we as Christians would say, yeah, we could do that. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over all the birds of the air, and over all the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Are we just one of the animals? No real difference between us and the animals? God's writing here would say, no, 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 no. You're special, but you're also responsible for the care of all of this. So God created humankind in God's image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Wait, I thought just men were created in the image of God. Didn't you? No, no, it should have been resounding. No, that's fine. Push back, push back. If I say something wrong or stupid, correct me. You know, dig in, you know, figure this out, right? No, in the, in male and female we created them in the image of God. There's an equality here that gets messed up by chapter three. That's next week. But the original creation is this amazing partnership and equality. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Then God said, verse 29, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. To every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, To everything that creeps along the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. I'm going to pause here for a second, and it was so. How many gods do we have to pray to or sacrifice to to be able to have that which we need? (laughs) You see the difference? 
God's like, look, I'm going to provide. I'm going to create, and then I'm even going to provide for that which is created. Verse 31. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. You see the difference? Once we've got humans into the picture, now God's like, okay, now it's very good. And there was evening, there was morning, the sixth day. Now we go to Genesis 2. It just continues the same account here. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all the work he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. It's a part of the New Testament that indicates that that seventh day just continued, continued, continued on and still is today. So that's why we see, you know, just the, the majority of this creative power kind of just kind of took a break, you know? And now we're living into that which God has kind of created all together. Now, verse 4 of chapter 2. Some would say this is going inward and you're kind of looking a little more closely at what went on. Others would say, no, this is like a completely different story of creation. In any case, those folks who said, we're trying to figure out what's inspired from God, said all of this is inspired from God. So they put it all together. And generation after generation the folks agreed. Not, yeah, this should be together. This is all inspired by God in some way, shape, or form to help us. So here we go, verse 4 of chapter 2. These are the generations of the... Oh, I'm sorry. Um, kind of concludes that and then, then goes into this, this kind of um, next narrative. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens... Now, in this case, it's just like one general day, all right? And you're going to see with all that goes on in this day, it's probably not like 24 hours. We're tra- probably just general. Here we go. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground, But a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. And then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. And I'll pause there for a second. Is this being truly a human until or without the breath of God? And I'd say, no, you know, it's that breath of God that then makes this being, this human being. And now we've got something that's very, very powerful and different and special. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord made, God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That'll come up next week in chapter 3. A river flows out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divides and becomes four branches. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one that flows around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedellium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon, and it is the one that flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris, which flows east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. (laughs) Now, for us, we're like, well, I don't know where any of those places are, but you get the sense that when this story is passed down from person to person to person, originally they were like, oh, yeah, okay, I know kind of generally what you're talking about, I guess, right? You know, they were like, oh, okay, all right. There's some some level of of detail here that they, they accept, and others where it's kind of a general thing that they're accepting. Verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. We're all, you know, work is not a bad thing. It was actually a good thing. But at this point, it's it's a creative, just wonderful thing to do with God, right? And the Lord God commanded the man, you may eat freely of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So God, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Now this would take some time, right? 
you get the sense that the day is pretty general here. I mean, it's going to take a while to kind of name everything here, interact with God, you know, and it's amazing. And you get what's happening, right? And to some extent, God's saying, well, I made all these other creatures. Isn't it good enough for this human to be in partnership with one of those animals? It sounds strange, but that's kind of the way the narrative is going. And so whatever the man called every living creature was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle, the birds of the air, to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not, a, not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs, closed up that place with flesh, and the rib the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. The word actually, you know, really meaning kind of out of man. Brought her to the man, and the man said, Woohoo! This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother, clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. That's a lot of scripture, right? I won't always read all of this every, every single Sunday. However, I wanted to make sure, because some of us have heard little bits and pieces, but we haven't actually in, interacted with this whole thing. And as you interact with it, hopefully some of it, you're like, wow, that's really, really cool. But interestingly, sometimes when we look at this, we say, now wait a second, that does not line up with my understanding of science and history that, that you know, I'm being taught now. And how, how does this all work? Like, there are folks who, and I have been tempted on multiple different occasions, to look at it through an, a set of eyes that is on this side of science and history and intellectual inquiry and philosophy and all these things that throughout the centuries we've developed. And I've looked at it from that set of eyes and said, wait a second, some of this doesn't line up. For instance, there's grass before there's sun. And we know that you can't have grass without the sun, right? It's like, you know, and you could go through and look at that kind of first account and then the second account of creation and say, wait, they don't really line up. On one hand, you've got six days of creation and a day of rest. Another one, you've got one full day of creation. This just doesn't make any sense. On this beginning story, you know, humans are created after everything's kind of created. And on this second story, there's kind of like this blah land and then humans are created and then other stuff is created. Did you pick up on all that kind of stuff? Have you seen that before maybe? You've kind of argued about that and you're like, wait, so should I just throw it all out? None of it's true, right? So for instance, the slide that has 24 hours, you know, is, it, is each one a 24 hour day? You know, what, what is it? How do we put this together? And it gets even more confusing as we interact with it and we say, things like, well, what does the word day mean? At the very beginning, it says he called the light day and the darkness he called night. Well, you've got then 12 hours as a day, right? Because it's kind of roughly, you know, 12 hours from sun up to sundown, you know, and so there you go. Well, it's only like 12 hours, but then later when you've got the earth and you've got morning and, and evening and you've got 24 hours then as a day, and then you've got the seventh day, God rests but then it just keeps on going for thousands of years, which is a good idea to negotiate with your employer that your day of rest should be a true Sabbath, which means once it starts, it just keeps on going for year after year after year, right? That's brilliant. And then in Genesis 2, that day has always got to be like just kind of this general kind of expanse of time because you've got all these things being done in there. You're like, wait a second, so is it not true? But yet these folks for centuries have put it together and said, no, 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 God is speaking through this. So in your bulletin, there are websites that if you want to dig into all the different ways of possibly interpreting this and making sense of it, all of those websites are put together by Christians. And, and each one has a little different flavor on how this should be interpreted. Some would say they're, they're all 24-hour days and a lot of our science right now is wrong. There, there are different ways to look at the science to make it fit. And in their 24-hour literal days, the earth is very, very young. There are others who would say, no, those days are very long. And they point out what I just pointed out with the different words there, you know, where day is, is kind of referring to different lengths of time. And they say, no, 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 it all fits pretty literally, but you just got to understand that day is a long period of time. And we don't know how much time elapsed between the days. We don't know. So there's that view. Then there's another view. This one will make some of our heads pop off. 
So let me give you an example of the, of the last one. The last one says the ancient peoples who were originally talking about this and sharing these stories, if we were to ask the questions of them that we ask today of the text, they would say, you've missed the point. You don't interact with the Bible like that. What do I mean? I mean, if we would have said, are they 24-hour days? And was this exactly the, 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 the way in which um, this was done and then this was done? Like, literally, is that exactly what happened? They might have said to us, you're being ridiculous. You need to look for the essentials and stick with the essentials because that's what the story was supposed to convey. What would the essentials be? Well, let me give you an example. How many gods are there? One God. Scientifically astute people can read this and understand that. And the ancient pre-science people would come to the exact same conclusion. Was it difficult for God? No. Did God want the world to exist? Yes. So those essentials, God exists. God wants the world to exist. Humans have a special place in God's heart. They're kind of a crowning jewel of God's creation. Those things the pre-science people understand and the after-science people both understand, and it's repeated. Those themes are repeated in book after book after book of the Bible. When you get to the New Testament, they, they, they don't even talk about the number of days or exactly how that went down. They don't even talk about it. But they do talk about there's one God. They do talk about how special humans are to God. They do talk about the fact that God loves us. Again, repeating, repeating, repeating. So I just wanted to make sure that you kind of hear that, that the, the three or four basic ways of understanding the Bible you can hold as a Christian. And, let me, and I promised you one example for that last one, because a lot of us have never even heard of that. And it sounds very strange, because the only thing we've ever heard is it's got to be absolutely literally true. And it may be. You'll, be very <laughs> you'll have some fun looking at some of those, those, um, those websites. However, the other view that it's, it's ancient literature that should be treated as ancient literature might look like this. What if I told Jennifer, let's say that Jennifer and I are going to go to dinner, and you remember there was a really heavy rain in this area not too many days ago, right? So let's say that on that particular day, I said, Jennifer, I call her up, and I'm here at the office, and I call her up, and I say, Jennifer, I'm going to leave in a minute, but right now I can't because it's raining cats and dogs outside, I mean, it is a monsoon outside, and I forgot my umbrella. So I'll, I'll leave in a minute, and uh, then we'll go to dinner when I'm home, okay? And then, 13 and a half minutes later, I actually leave. And I get home, and she says, you liar. You liar. You said you would leave in a minute. You did not leave in a minute. You left in 13 and a half minutes. Liar! And then I looked outside, and Jennifer's like, I looked outside, and there are not piles of dead dogs and cats outside. You liar! And then she says, and I called the National Weather Service, and it was not a monsoon outside. You liar! From the details, I did lie. I was wrong. I did not give the facts. But would she have said all of those things? No, because she would have said, the point of what you said was absolutely true. You lived into it. You didn't wait two hours to leave. You left in a small amount of time, which is what you meant. Yeah, it was raining hard outside. You didn't actually specifically mean that there were dogs and cats falling from the sky and that it was technically a monsoon, okay? Now, I, I don't know if it's exactly literal or if it's more like that, but there are Christians that believe all the different shades of that, and I want to make sure that you understand that because that gives our faith incredible power that Jesus died and rose from the dead, that's rock solid. And that's repeated again and again and again in the New Testament. But the New Testament authors look at the creation story and they focus on the essentials. And you can live and die on the essentials and then have friendly arguments over your interpretation of the specifics. Do you see what I mean? And we're going to find a lot of parts of the Bible like that. And people will freak out maybe and they'll be like, no, it's got to be exactly one way. And we're like, no, wait a second. The minute we go into that territory, then we've gone beyond the way that the New Testament authors use the Old Testament. I'm not going to be more strict with the Old Testament than the New Testament authors were. That'd be ridiculous. Especially Jesus himself. When we get into how Jesus uses the Old Testament, he gets kind of creative sometimes. And it's really cool. And God moves and, and, and just speaks. So what's the point? The point is that if you're today feeling like, I'm not sure my life is worth much. I, I thought I would have done more by this point in my life. <laughs> 
then you need to kind of come back to Genesis 1 and 2 and read that again and realize, you know what? If God thought you were unimportant, God would not have created you. You wouldn't exist. So you don't have to ask yourself, do I matter? Is this worth it? You don't have to ask yourself this. So the answer is already there, and it's clear pre-science and after science. You matter so much that God wanted to create us in God's image. If you're really mad at somebody, do you have to decide whether or not to hate them forever and write them out of your life? No, you don't have to even think about it because you look at them and you say, I kind of hate your guts right now, but you're created in the image of God. It's just really hard to see the image there. But you matter to God. God loves you. And though we may not be able to talk very well, I'm still going to pray for you because God loves you. You see how that frames our entire life? And you get up in the morning and you say, man, I don't feel like much. And man, my, my body's kind of creaking or whatever. Or man, I've got this horrible test. Or these people are picking on me. And you step back and you say, wait a second. The heavenly father that created all of those stars loves me, wants me to exist, wants to be with me forever. So I don't care what those people say. I matter. I'm loved. And I'm going to hold my head high and I'm going to live today knowing that my God loves me. Let's pray. So God, we know that there is an evil force in the world that wants us to think about all the things that we do wrong and all the ways that we are wrong and all the ways that we don't measure up. And that evil force is really strong. And there are a lot of people in our culture that are on its side, that tear people down, that don't lift people up, that want to say it's all an accident, or that humans aren't really that special. But you have revealed in pre-science times and after-science times that you exist, that you love us, and that you cherish us and want to be with us forever and ever. So may we believe that all the more and live knowing that that's true of each and every one of us. By the Holy Spirit's power we pray. Amen.